So if you have your copy of God's Word, please go ahead and, and, and get it out. We are studying through the Gospel according to John, and we come today to the 19th chapter, three chapters to go. Just by way of reminder, last week we saw the initial encounter between Pontius Pilate and Jesus Christ, and we saw some back and forth there, and we, we, we made application of the fact that these two men uh, in some ways represent one, the kingdom of this world, and one, the kingdom of God. Pilate there, of course, representing the kingdom of this world, a man that had come to power, that wielded his power with might and brawn and muscle, that um, sought to have men under his thumb, living in fear of, of him. And we saw Jesus there looking meek and lowly in chains, being arrested, giving up his life, but really he is the one that has all power and authority, representing the kingdom of God. We continue now seeing some of this um, back and forth with today Pilate and the Jews, and this is the account of Jesus being handed over to be crucified. So I'm going to begin in John chapter 19 and verse 1, and this is God's holy, all-sufficient word. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. And the chief priests and the officers saw him. They cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. And Pilate heard this statement. He was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the stone pavement, and in, in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now, it was a day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold, your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to be crucified. May God bless the reading of His Word. Father, we do come and we do pray and ask Your blessing upon this time. Lord, I, as a, as a man, a sinner, am desperately in need of You uh, in this moment. Pray that You might richly bless the proclamation of Your Word. Pray, Lord, that You would help us with the distractions of life, with the weakness of our flesh that is easily distracted, tired, um, thinking about things to do after church, but God, would you give us full attention for this short hour? Would you keep hearts and minds set upon the Word and set upon Christ? We ask that you would work here today by the power of your Spirit through the proclamation of your Word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we look at this narrative today, I want to see today three portraits of three men that are in this account. And I want to examine their actions, examine who they are, and see what we might glean today from God's 
word. So we come firstly to this man, Pontius Pilate. And we began to see Pilate this week, or last week, and we see that there has been some really false accusations brought up against the Lord Jesus, really a sham of charges that are being propagated against Jesus. One would think, as Pilate is a governor, he's a leader, he is the prefect of Judea, one would think that if someone was going to stand for justice and for righteousness, that it ought to be that civil servant representing the people. That ought to be this man, Pilate, who is a representative of the Roman Empire. We read in Romans 13 that the government is ordained of God, right? For the good of man, for to condemn evil and to facilitate peace. So one would hope that Pilate would seek to bring justice and truth in a case like this. We will see here, as we consider Pilate, the first thing I want to draw out and to, to see is his conviction. Pilate does seem to be under some conviction. It might not be spirit-wrought, irresistible grace leading unto salvation in Christ sort of conviction, but he does seem to understand that this is wrong, what is happening. If we look back in our text today, and we're going to bounce around quite a bit um, in, in John 19, Matthew 27, and Luke 23. So if you want to follow along, maybe mark those places. If not, I'll, I'll be reading them. But back in our text in John, verse 6 of John 19, it says there that when the chief priests and the officers saw him, Jesus, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Now Pilate said to them, take him for yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. I don't see that he's done anything wrong. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Now, when Pilate heard the statement, he was even more afraid. Apparently, he's already concerned. He's already afraid. Now, he's more afraid because Jesus has claimed to be the Son of God. He enters his headquarters and asks him, where are you from? Jesus gave no answer. And Pilate said, will you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to let you go and to crucify you? So you see that Pilate seems to be wrestling with some sort of conviction. I find no guilt in this man. He seems to be looking within himself to, to find some courage to stand and to do what is right. We read also in Matthew 27, verse 17, that when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas, the criminal, or Jesus, who is called Christ? It says he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Pilate knew that the Jews were jealous of Jesus, and that's why, one of the reasons, that they had delivered him up. It also says in verse 19, besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a word saying, have nothing to do with this righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him in a dream today. The Jews continually wanted uh, Jesus to be crucified. And Pilate asked them, what evil has he done? He understands this is, this is a phony charge. And then we see even more in Luke chapter 23. Pilate then called together, verse 13, the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who is misleading the people and after examining him before you, behold, I do not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish him and release him. It seems very clear that Pilate understands the situation. Pilate understands that Jesus is an innocent man. None of these charges are sticking. None of these things are true. He has not found anything in Christ that they are insinuating that has taken place. He even understands that the Jews have ulterior motives, that their hearts are not pure, their motivations are not pure, that they're jealous, they're envious of Christ. They're mad at Him for many of the things that He has said of them. We even see that He was frightened to hear the title of the Son of God. He was concerned. Who is this man? He asked Jesus, where are you from? 
Who in the world are you? And lastly, we even see that his own wife had a dream about Christ. God only knows the content of the dream, but we do know this, that she told him, this is a righteous man, and she had suffered mightily in the dream because of him. You see, Pilate has an opportunity here. He has an opportunity to do what's right, to be courageous, to stand up for the truth, to to go with his conscience and do what is obviously the right thing to do, or he has another option, and he sadly chooses option B. We see conviction, and then we see cowardice. We see conviction, and then we see cowardice. Matthew 27 and verse 24, when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, he's trying, he's trying kind of half-heartedly to stop the bloodthirst, to, to calm down the crowds. But he says when, it, it says when he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. He tries to simply wash his hands before the crowd and say, it's on you then. It's your responsibility. His blood be on your hands. I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. It's a sad situation. I believe this weakness of Pilate is a, is a weakness, sadly, that we see today. We live in a world that, from my assertion at least, needs men that have backbones. Men that are going to stand with courage. Men that will stand faithfully in the face of opposition. Men that will stand with conviction for the truth and let the chips fall where they may. Men that are not man-pleasers, as we see here with Pilate, simply going along with the crowd. Men that fear God, have reverence of God, and not men. Men that are not overly concerned with safety and comfort, but are concerned with truth, what is right and what is just. God help us to be such men. Amen? So Pilate tries to wash his hands of the whole affair, as if he can just shirk responsibility and throw it on the Jews. What did he just say to Christ? He told him, do you not know that I have the response? I have the authority to release you, and I have the authority to crucify you. But now he seeks to shirk his responsibility and place it on the Jews. Beloved, we cannot simply wash our hands of sin. We cannot simply push our responsibilities, our duties upon others. Was this not the response of our first parents in the garden with that first sin? Remember Eve, her response to what had taken place, she said it was the serpent. It was his fault. He deceived me. He caught me in a weak moment. I fell for his ploy and I ate. And what does Adam say? He said it was the woman that you gave me. Whoo! Whoa, man. The very first sin, blame shifting, subverting responsibility, and Adam says, God, it was the woman that you gave me. You know who she was. You knew what she was going to do. You gave her to me. Adam is even pointing blame at God himself. Now look what happens with Pilate down in verse 12 of John 19. He sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. It comes down to this for Pilate, his livelihood. His livelihood. He is concerned now. I mean, if a riot breaks out, the blood is going to be upon his head. He's responsible for this region. He could even lose his life. Right? He's the Roman prefect. If a war breaks out in the land that he's governing, certainly the responsibility would be on his head. Head. So it comes down to his livelihood. Uh, these men are trying to put him as an opposition to Caesar. So he turns to cowardice. He shirks his responsibility. I believe that God would have us stand for truth. 
I believe that God would have us stand for what is right and trust Him with the results. Right? That we don't bend our convictions because of foreseen hardship, but that we stand with conviction for the truth and trust God with whatever results may come. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. There's a great little story just kind of thrown in there in Hebrews chapter 10 that I want to show kind of brings this idea out of of trusting God even with our own safety. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 says there, but recall the former days when after you were enlightened, after you came to know the saving gospel, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those that are in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Now, do you understand what's happening here? This is a time when persecution was beginning to ramp up. It was not fully um, activated, if you will, in the first century. Persecution would have been regional, and it would ramp up at times and diminish at times. It was not empire-wide, but these saints had suffered. They had struggled with sufferings. They had been publicly exposed to reproach and affliction. And notice what has happened. Some of the brethren are incarcerated. They've been arrested for probably coming up against the state with fake charges like Christ. Now let's imagine if this was our day and a couple of the brethren are in jail. They got picked up on the street for preaching the gospel. And it's been called hate speech and they're in jail. We're going to go visit Trevor, got himself arrested. But this is not 2021, this is the first century, so there's no three hots in a cot, right? He needs food, he needs a blanket, he needs his daily provisions. But what happens if we go to the jail? We're going to be marked as those of the way. We're going to identify ourselves as Christians and expose ourselves and put ourselves out there as brothers of this guy, this criminal, and as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what, is, what do these saints do? They took that half day's walk. They had compassion on the brethren that were incarcerated. And they went back home to find their house plundered, their property taken. But they joyfully accepted the reproach of Christ. They joyfully accepted the plundering of their property because they knew they had a better possession and an abiding one. They believed that God would have them love the brethren, exposing also their allegiance to Christ and taking whatever resulted when the outcome and trusting that to the hand of God. They stood with courage. They did what was right. They did not shrink back in the face of adversity. Now remember, these were those saints that refused to say two little words. Kaiser Kurios. Now they could have avoided all sorts of hardship, even death at times, being thrown into the lion's den or thrown into the the arena by simply saying two words, Kaiser Kurios, and putting a little pinch of incense on the altar. Caesar is Lord. That's all they had to do. Now imagine in our day, if someone came to you and said, listen, all you have to do is kneel before the picture of the president. They won't take your home. They won't take your children. They won't harm you. You just have to bow before the president. Just do it and get it over with so that you can go on with your life. It's not a big deal. God knows your heart and he knows that you love him. Maybe not publicly, but this is the one thing that these Christians refused to do because they believed Christus, kurios, Christ is king. Christ is Lord. All they had to do was say Caesar is Lord. The Romans had many gods. 
You could be a Christian, you could be a pagan, you could be anything, as long as you were also willing to just give a little pinch of incense. That's it. And just say the words. Come on, brother, you don't have to mean it. They're going to take your house. They're going to take your children. And these saints were unwilling to say those two words because they had a true, sovereign, single Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ. This is the context that they found themselves in in the first century. And I believe that the the Lord would have us today, beloved, stand courageously. We face nothing like they did. Not today. God knows the future. We don't. But I believe He would stand or have us to stand not with cowardice, but with courage. Now, things are not as obvious maybe today. But I think we all realize today that this world that we live in hates our God. Now you've got to understand that there's no neutrality here. It's not, a, it's not a middle of the road thing, but the world is coming up against the kingdom of God more and more and more. Flaunting the things that God says are evil. It's today, I think, June 6th, right? It's the month of June. So, in America, across the globe, to, today for the month, we are celebrating immorality. Right, we are rejoicing in, this nation is, something that we call pride. Right? Perversion. Wickedness. We are, as a people, celebrating the very thing that, God, that caused God to bring fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and, and if you turn on the TV, if you go to a website, you're going to see 99.9% of every corporation flying their rainbow flag this month to make sure that you know that they're along with this wicked agenda of the world. The world is celebrating the very things that God says will condemn a person to hell. And you are called to to bow, to go along with this. The question, beloved, is will we stand courageously opposed to things that God hates or will we be cowardice and simply say, I don't want to be I don't want to be mean. I don't want to be seen as not nice. I don't want to speak out against these things. I'll just kind of keep quiet and shrink back. Well, as we see with Pilate, he had a conviction. He knew what was right and what to do. He responded in cowardice. And thirdly, we see it leads to capitulation. Capitulation. He conforms to their demands. He goes against his conscience. He goes against what he knows is right to save his own skin. He even sends an innocent man to his death. Matthew 27 and 22, Pilate said to them, What shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And he asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. Verse 25 of Matthew 27, And all the people answered, His blood be on us, and on our children. What a thing to say. His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Mark 15.15 15 gives more illumination. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd. There it is. To satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Luke 23, 23, they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. To their will. Do you see that as he did not stand courageously for truth, for what was right, his cowardice led to capitulation. He allowed social pressures, louder voices to dictate how he would respond, where he would stand and not stand, and he just eventually went with the pressure of the crowd. This world today wants you, beloved, to bow. Not to just be tolerant, 
not to just kind of go along silently, but it wants you to bow to evil and depravity. It wants you to celebrate the things it celebrates. It wants you to show your allegiance to the new modern doctrines of a secular nation. God would have us to stand. God would have us not to be swept away by the currents of this world, but to resist and stand upon the word of God and let the chips fall where they may. We see in Pilate what we see in many unbelievers. An ungodly man satisfied with his sin. Not concerned about the truth, not concerned about God, not concerned about virtue, but he lives ultimately to please himself, to advance his own cause. He had a chance, even as a pagan, as an unbeliever, to stand for truth, to protect, to protect the innocent, yet he chose to please himself and advance his own cause. Next, we see the Jews. This is kind of a mixed bunch. We have the leaders and we have the people. But what we've seen in this narrative is that the leaders easily manipulate the people and the masses just go along with the crowd. Now, these Jews are, of course, part of the religious establishment of the day. But what they've done is they have exalted the traditions of men, the traditions of the elders, the oral teaching of the elders above even the word of God. Jesus calls them out for this in Matthew chapter 15. In verse 6. He says, so for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. They had taken things like hand washing and made it a burden for the people. They had taken a thing like the Sabbath and added hundreds of extra rules and laws how you can live, how you cannot on the Sabbath day, and made it a burden for the people. They're known for oppressing the people of God with too much uh, religious rules to keep them under their thumb. These are self-righteous, wicked men with an external veil of religiosity. First, as we look at the Jews, I want to show, I want to see their wounded egos. Their wounded egos. Their, their place as the unquestioned holy men of the day has been challenged by Christ. Matthew 27 and 17. Again, we read this, but it says there, uh, Pilate asked the crowd, who do you want me to release, Barabbas or Jesus? And it says he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. He knew that it was out of envy. They were, they were jealous. Now, Jesus has said some very strong things to the Pharisees, has he not? I think that today, uh, if a person was to say some of the things Jesus said, there would be many a Christian that would take him aside and rebuke him for not speaking nice enough or, or not engaging someone as he should biblically. But Jesus came with strong words for religious hypocrites that led people astray with false doctrine. You may remember that Jesus told them that they were of their father, the devil. They said they were children of Abraham. And he said, no, your father is the devil. He told them they preach, but don't practice. Yes, that is a, that is a biblical saying. He said they tie heavy burdens upon people too much to bear. They put a rope with a rock around people's neck. They walk around weighed down. He said, you do your deeds to be seen by men. You, you preach and you speak and you pray because you like the show of it all. He said, you love the place of honor in the best seats in the front row where everyone pats you on the back and looks up to you. He said, you make long prayers. Nothing wrong with long prayers unless you do it to be seen by men. He said, you travel long to make one proselyte and you turn him into a twofold child of hell. They would go to meet a disciple and he says, you damn him twice as bad as you are because you are teaching him your damnable doctrine. He called them blind guides, leading men into pits. He said, you strain gnats and you swallow camels. And he said, you are whitewashed tombs, cleaned up and beautiful on the outside, but inside is dead man's bones. We see their jealousy 
in John chapter 12, the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. They're saddened by the fact that their disciples are turning from them and following Christ. As we see the Jews, many of the Jews at least, I don't want to broad brush all the Jews, but the majority of the Jews uh, are, are concerned with their appearance, their prestige, and their power. And they're so blinded by these things that they have missed the Messiah right before their eyes. As we see these men, we see, beloved, how dangerous is pride. How dangerous pride can be in the heart of a man. Pride blinds us, me, you, from seeing the truth. Pride blinds you and I from being corrected, from being lovingly rebuked. The man that's filled with pride always has an answer, always has a response, always has an excuse, always has a reason why his sin is not as bad as it seems on the outside. But God says, or God does, oppose the proud, but gives grace to the humble, according to James chapter 4. We read in Proverbs 16, 18 that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The Bible says that pride leads to ruin. It will destroy a man. And these men are filled with pride. God help us in our pride. We see in these men how dangerous self-righteous religion is. Self-righteous religion. These men think that by their performance, they have worked their way to God. That they are righteous in and of themselves. That God is so pleased with their religious activities, with their holy living, that they can achieve salvation by their performance. I have to say that if you're here today and if you believe that by your performance, by anything that you've done, any act of righteousness, any good deed, any faithful church attendance, that if you believe that those things are the reason that God has accepted you, that you could somehow by your performance work your way to God. That is a false gospel. We come to God only with the sin that needs to be cleansed. These were men that thought they stood head and shoulders above everyone else because of their religious works. These are men that thanked God that they were not like all of those other terrible sinners out there. But may we, beloved, see their example. May we be those that cling to the cross of Calvary. As the song says, and I won't, I won't sing it to you today or for you, um, but the song says, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to Thee for dress, helpless look to Thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. And we come to God with nothing but the sin that condemns us. Our repentance is granted by God. Our faith is the gift of God. Christ has done it all. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. According to the Scriptures, alone for the glory of God alone. We see next in these Jews their false allegiance to the state. John 19, 12, Pilate from then on sought to release him, Jesus, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. In verse 14, he said to the Jews, behold your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? King, And the chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Now, (laughs) beloved, you have to see the irony here of these men. All of a sudden, they are faithful patriots of the Roman Empire and faithfully serving Caesar, right? You, You know the nickname that the Jews had for Gentiles, right? They were dogs. And dogs were different back then. We're not talking Labradoodles or whatever custom designer dog that you might spend two thousand dollars on dogs were scavengers they had diseases they were basically large rats that people did not want around and that was what the jews called the gentiles they were dogs 
We saw last week that they would not even enter the palace of Pilate because they would become ceremonially unclean simply by going into the residence of a Gentile. But here today, now all of a sudden, they are good subjects who love Caesar, love the Roman Empire, and are, they are confessing their allegiance to him. We see in these men a wicked willingness to lie, to twist, to steal, to maneuver any way that they can to have Jesus sent to his death. In Pilate, we saw an example of an ungodly man that does not care about God. He has no concern, really, for God's truth, for virtue, for what is right. Ultimately, he wants to serve himself. And we see here in these Jews, self-righteous religious men who think themselves good before God, don't see in themselves a need for a Savior, for repentance, for forgiveness, and Jesus has disrupted their religious power grab. Lastly, beloved, we see Christ. We've seen Pilate, we see the Jews, now we see Christ. We see Christ here offering Himself as a ransom for wicked men. Offering even Himself for these men, should they hear, turn, repent, acknowledge their sin, and trust in Him. And we see here Christ offering Himself even for you today, friend. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. But it is only through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone that any man, woman, or child is ever cleansed of their sin. I ask you here right now in this place, have you come to Christ? Have you come to Him and Him alone for your eternal salvation? Have you entrusted your soul in His hands to be washed and cleansed? We see firstly in Christ His humility. His humility. Again, back then to the beginning of John where we started we see that Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. He took Jesus and flogged him. The Roman Empire had three forms of corporal punishment. A beating, a flogging, and a severe flogging or a scourging. Jesus gets the third, the worst, as any man would, before he is to be crucified. Jesus here would have been stripped bare, he, he would have been have his arms tied around a post, secured to a post, bent over, probably on his knees, and a man would come out with a whip, and that whip would have a thong at the end with bone and metal, fragments of pottery, and he would whip, and he would whip, and he would whip, and he would shred his back to pieces. Bones would be exposed, internal organs would be exposed. Very often, a man would die on that post, and a corpse would be pinned to that cross as Rome had to make its statement. And we see that here with our Lord. He is flogged. He is brutalized. We see the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on His head. Drove those, those thorns into His skull. We see them array Him in a purple robe. Now, of course, this was no place of honor. A robe was for a king. Purple was a royal color. But they are doing anything but honoring our Lord here. They are mocking Him, treating Him as a phony, false king. They came up to Him saying, Hail the King of the Jews! Pretending as if He was a king, and they struck Him with their hands. Imagine, beloved, imagine the humility of Christ allowing Pilate to order His flogging. Imagine the humility of Christ allowing this man to whip him over and over and over that he was close to his death. Imagine the humility of Christ allowing these men to treat him like a fool as they strike him with their own hand. Yet he turns the other cheek. He allows suffering and shame and obedience to his Father. Do you see the amazing humility of Christ? And you think about us in our own life, how often we want vindication. Someone wronged us. They said something they shouldn't have said. They treated me in a way that I should not be treated. And we want to demand our rights. We want recompense. We want it now. And Christ, in His humility, willingly offers up Himself to sacrifice for sinners. May we not revile when reviled. May we not return evil for evil. Lastly, we see 
Christ bear witness to the end. Bear witness to the truth to the end. He is humble, but he is strong. Right? He is meek, and meekness, as they say, is not weakness. Meekness is strength restrained. And in verse 11, Pilate asked him, Are you going to answer me? I have the authority to kill you or to let you go. The one thing Jesus says in this passage, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. The only reason, the singular reason why you stand in this place on that judgment seat is because my Father has ordained it to be so. Jesus was not afraid of a tyrant. He was not afraid of a wicked ruler, thirsting for power, willing even to kill an innocent man to help himself. He bears witness to the end of a sovereign God of absolute authority. A God that is so sovereign that it is He and only He that is here granting the execution of His Son. Beloved, as I close, as I wrap this up, we see with these portraits many things we can emphasize. I see one thing that stands out above the rest. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Jesus came into the world to save ungodly men like Pilate, men that revel in their sin, love their sin, that are unconcerned with God, that live for self. As someone said, the unholy trinity, me, myself, and I. Men that scoff and mock and think themselves wiser than God. Cowardly men that refuse to stand for truth, refuse to stand for what is right. Christ Jesus came to save such men. We see in our text, Christ came to save self-righteous, religious people. That in their pride think that they can achieve right standing with God. That think themselves to be good people. That think themselves to have no need of repentance, no need of forgiveness. Listen, friend, if you hear in these portraits yourself, if you hear in these portraits your own life, turn today to Christ and live. Turn today and find life, precious, eternal life in God and in God alone. There is hope for you today. There is hope for us all today. And any man, any woman, any child that would come to Christ repenting and believing the good news that Jesus alone saves. Amen? Let me pray. Father, we do, we do thank you that you somehow would allow wicked men to abuse your own son. Lord Jesus, that you would put up with scorn, with abuse, and ultimately that you would give your life to die. You did that to save. You did that to forgive. You did that to show mercy. And you did that to bring a people to yourself. God, I thank you that you have brought us into that number. I thank you for every redeemed soul in this room, the work that you have done, are doing, and will do. God, I pray if there is any here today that do not know Jesus savingly, that you would by your Spirit convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and that you would reveal your perfect mercy, that they would respond in faith. Pray all these things in Jesus' holy name.